First of all, hello everybody and welcome to the workshop. Um, for the people who are here, the people who are coming in, I'm a little bit late. Uh, my name is Anthony Jones. I'm on the learning design team here at Pathstream and I'm your host for tonight. Uh, just wanna kick things off by telling you all, just thank you so much to everyone who's attending live and hello out there to everyone who might be watching the recording later. Uh, I just wanna say that by showing up, you're taking an active interest in your career growth. And I wanna take a moment to call that out because it's super important first and foremost, that you're showing that interest in taking this step. So hello and welcome. Um, and second of all, welcome to our community. Um, we might have some, some current students here, some former students, um, some people who just might be curious about the subject matter, but everyone who's here today is part of the Pastream community. So hello and welcome. Um, this is the second webinar in our workshop series on designing your career. Uh, maybe some of you were here last week where my colleague Lauren conducted a how-to workshop on informational interviews. Um, this is something, if you didn't happen to catch it, you can watch a recording of it on our YouTube channel if you missed it. Um, but today we have a panel discussion on economic trends, in-demand job skills, and tips for how to pursue new job opportunities in a post-pandemic world. Uh, just some logistics before we get into the panel discussion. Um, Feel free to ask questions throughout the session using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, definitely anytime a question pops into your head, you can put it there. If it's something that we can answer easily via chat, uh, Lauren or another colleague will tackle that. And keep in mind that we will have an audience Q&A at the end and we'll try to answer every single question that you all ask. Um, and of course, a recording of today's workshop will be emailed to you after the session and you will also be able to see it on our YouTube channel, you just search for Pastream on YouTube, subscribe, and you'll be able to watch it later too. So the agenda is pretty simple. We're going to have a discussion with Eleanor Cooper and Amy Hearn. You'll learn more about who these people are very shortly. And then we'll have the audience Q&A where you can ask them any questions that you might be curious about on the subject matter. Um, just to establish today's goal, first and foremost, um, we want to have a robust conversation around what jobs and skills are most in demand in 2021, as well as some other tips you absolutely need to know about the job search process in a post-pandemic world. Um, but now let's move on to the stars of our show for tonight. Um, we have, again, Eleanor Cooper and Amy Ahern. Eleanor Cooper is Past Dreams co-founder and CEO and Amy Ahern is Past Dreams VP of Career Services. Eleanor and Amy, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us, Anthony. It's a treat it's to an, be here. It's, it, it's an absolute pleasure always to talk to two of my colleagues who continually inspire me with their hard work and passion when it comes to serving our student population and making sure that folks out there achieve their career goals. Um, but just to, give a, just to give a little bit of sense of the background, Eleanor, I'm wondering if um, you could take a moment to tell those in attendance today, what inspired you to start Pastream in the first place? Sure, uh, I'll give the a short version of the story, but uh, essentially I grew up in a small town in North Carolina and it's been abundantly clear to me throughout my entire life from being an early, early childhood um, through elementary school and middle school and high school and going off to college and after college, I, I went to college in, in North Carolina and then moved to New York City, where I started a career working in finance there. And looking back over the years and keeping in touch with friends and family at home, it's always been really clear to me how much access to education, access and exposure to different career paths and opportunities is just so different for different people, depending on their background and the family they come from and what they're exposed to. And so... Uh, I, I'm really proud to be a part of this team that is working on expanding access to more individuals to pursue their own dreams and their own passions, unlock their own potential so that they can make whatever they like of their career and of their lives um, as a result as well. Yeah, that's a that's a great a great summation of the of the origin story. And and Amy, I just wanted to turn to you quickly. And I know you have so much passion um, for ed tech, and I'm I'm just curious why you know, in your career, you've chosen to focus on career services in particular. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. So I've worked in education about my whole career at a variety of different universities and institutions and online learning companies. But I think what really stood out to me about Pastream is that we care about job outcomes and actually connecting what people learn in our courses to 
real world jobs and opportunities. And so that has been the exciting challenge that I have gotten to take on in past three. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing summation and a great transition into the meat of our conversation. So let's just, let's just jump right into it. Um, the first question that we have tonight, and I think this might be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds who are listening is what patterns in the economy do you feel like were accelerated by the pandemic? And what does that mean for the types of jobs that are going to be most in demand over the next six to 12 months? And Eleanor, I'm hoping we can, we can start with you on this question. I'd say one of the biggest trends has been digitization in, in, in a number of different ways. So in one way, we've seen an acceleration of automation. Many companies that all of a sudden had to shift their supply chains or dramatically reduce their workforce due to budget cuts had to suddenly start considering what kind of technologies can we bring in that can, that can reduce our costs and standardize our systems and reduce our, our dependency on various parts of our labor force. And that's a trend that's been going on for many years, but the pandemic really accelerated that. Um, and so jobs that are more, more manual and are repetitive of a similar task is there's been more and more uh, automation put into place with machines um, and technology that replaces that, that repetitive work. Um, another piece of digitization has been that large, with large, we've seen really large industry swings in COVID. So obviously certain parts of the economy were really hit hard. So the travel industry was hit really hard, right? There's, you know, even um, like a lot of retail and, and food services, et cetera, lots of jobs were lost. And then there's other parts of the economy that had really rapid growth, everything from, you know, Zoom, the Zoom platform to toilet paper, um, to all, all sorts of things that are very specific to being remote and in an online world and how our lives have all changed. And so with that dramatic shift in some industries really accelerating and some industries collapsing, um, now that we're coming back to a you know, sort of post-COVID more normalized society, that's starting to balance back out. And so all of a sudden, these industries that had to you know, let go of large portions of their labor force are having to hire back really quickly. And other industries that had these, this big boom of demand and it's now you know, normalizing back out are probably having to refigure out, you know, do we need the same capacity? What does this look like on, in a post-COVID basis? And so with all of this shift has meant that lots of new roles are opening up. And when, in, when these industries that are now hiring a lot they want to hire individuals with the latest skill sets. And they're, they're you know, re-looking at, well, if we're going to rehire it in our marketing team, we want to make sure that we're hiring individuals who have the latest and best practices, right? So it's probably a different job description that they have now than they would have had you know, pre-pandemic because the times have changed and technology has changed and the practices have changed. Um, and then you know, maybe one other you know, piece within that is just a lot, of, a lot of aspects of how we do things has obviously gone online. So the way that we... You know, um, interview for jobs and learn things and work, all of those, you know, we, we've, in, we've taken a lot of those fully online and now we'll have them not always fully online, but still hybrid, still an online component, which is, has increased the need for digital literacy and just a comfort with digital communication, digital collaboration. So whether you're needing to interview uh, in a virtual environment or work in a remote, in a remote job or work with people who are in a remote position um, or learn things online, uh, increased fluency in a digital environment has been very important. Yeah, that's, you just said a lot. That's, that's incredibly interesting. And one of the things that you said that just stand, that stood out to me personally is this idea of a job getting cut and then the job coming back in a post pandemic world, but the job description, it's not the job description of last year. It's a new job description that reflects some of those skills that are going to be more in demand that, that you alluded to. Um, Amy, kind of same question, and, and, I, and I think you'll be able to maybe double click on some of the ideas that Eleanor was, was throwing out there. Yeah, definitely. I would highlight four key trends. So the first, if you advance to the next slide, is that we are increasingly seeing that really every job is becoming a tech job. So even if you're working in a more traditional company, having the ability to use data to analyze insights and trends to be able to think about marketing messages, to be able to have basic kind of spreadsheet skills. These are going to be the norm. And we are seeing that those kind of tech jobs both maintained relatively stable job posting numbers during the pandemic, but they are also continuing to rebound. And more and more companies are recognizing that they need these kind of tech skills and roles. So that is a definite trend that we are seeing, like Eleanor mentioned. 
The second thing, and I was actually just on a call with a student who was asking about the rise of remote work and whether more companies are going to be open to this. And if you look at this data from Indeed, which as some of you probably know, is one of the largest job aggregator sites, you are seeing that per the percentage of job postings that contain remote work, remote friendly, remote search terms, that is continuing to rise from January of last year. And this trend, trend line just keeps going up. And we think that you know, even as companies begin to reopen their offices, it will increasingly be common that people who have technical skill sets can likely negotiate to work part-time or full-time remote. So even if you don't see it posted in a job description, it's something you can definitely ask about um, as you start to interview and get offers. And you can see that this trend is holding true across a variety of sectors. So even things you might not think about like banking or arts and entertainment or therapy, you are increasingly seeing that remote work is going to become the norm. The second or third trend we are now starting to see is that freelance work, which used to be you had to kind of have individual relationships in order to find, now is becoming increasingly common because of new platforms like Upwork and Fiverr and even more specialized ones. So that if you have the kind of skill sets in marketing or data analysis or software development, you can pick up a side project or multiple that you do for several different companies and build that portfolio of work, um, either as your full-time job or on the side of a more traditional career and get paid directly through these platforms. So we are continuing to see that a lot of work is becoming freelance and these platforms are growing and growing. And then the last thing we definitely want to acknowledge is that there are certain populations that, you know, have had increased responsibilities during the pandemic and not all of these have gone away yet. And so those include things like childcare or having to support the household while other people are out of work or sick. And so we are seeing this trend of women increasingly are out of the workforce and now trying to re-enter. And so if you fall into that category, we have found, you know, a variety of different sites and organizations that are focused on helping women return to work after they might have been in caregiving roles or, you know, helping people find freelance projects and other sources of income that they can fit around some of these daily responsibilities. But those are kind of four trends that we are definitely monitoring closely in this post-COVID world. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting and also I think powerful that um, you and others have been able to aggregate resources around some of these. So like the trends of say freelance work, there are, you know, a lot of good places to go to find those opportunities. And, you know, to the point that you made in the fourth trend to help women who might've been forced out of the labor force to, to get back in now in a post um, pandemic world. Uh, so we can see that, um, you know, to the points that both of you just made, we can see that tech jobs are growing. Um, remote work is on the rise. Freelance work is expanding and a sizable labor force has dropped off and is likely seeking reintegration. Um, I'm just hoping we can take a moment now and drill into what some of these tech jobs actually are and what they look like. And it sounds like many of them maybe are even remote or potentially freelance opportunities. So Eleanor, I wanted to um, toss this question over to you and just hear about what you see as being some of the fastest growing career paths based on the research that we all do here and what are some of the digital skill sets that enable folks to be competitive for these roles? So, uh, you know, we are, we're coming out of a very strange time. And because of that, there, there's been a, a really in, a significant increase in certain um, parts of the economy with lots of more, lots more healthcare jobs. There are lots more jobs in construction and um, parts of the market that are really course correcting and putting our economy back together and um, addressing the needs that were created during COVID. And so those are all kind of moment in time and um, like specific trends. What we focus on here at PathStream is uh, certain career categories that are across essentially every single industry and also are, you know, uh, are spread across the entire world, not just in the US as well. And so what's important about um, the types of jobs that, that when we think about building a new program in Pathstream, we think about programs and skill sets and career paths that have 
long-term upward mobility trajectories, that they are long-term industry trends where these are growing jobs that have strong fundamentals of, when you look at the types of jobs that are on this list right here, you think about all of the companies that, that are out there that now have increasingly need to do marketing, not just in person, but in, in you know, print format, but have to go online. And that's increasingly, that is how companies reach their users. And so that's a fundamental trend across every industry. Project management, the more we have human, uh, human capital and knowledge economy and um, in, in people working together to accomplish goals, Project management, remote work is a big part of needing to be managed by project managers um, is sort of playing into that trend. Of course, the rise of data, we can't probably go, go uh, without a day of having news articles come out about the rise of data and data analytics and how data is gonna transform our lives and data privacy and, and um, the good and the bad that comes from it. But that's created such a need for everything from cleaning data to making sense of that data to communicating about that data across organizations that Data analytics is a category, but there are so many jobs that require data as a skill set, or that you can be actually paid more if you're even able to communicate with people um, who, who specifically actually work with data. Um, and then Salesforce is a big enough, uh, big enough brand that it's its own career category, but it really represents uh, managing uh, a platform that has all of the customer and contact information uh, for a company. And, and as you might imagine, for any company, their list of how they organize the information about their who their customers are, the information of keeping track of those, how those change over time, what those customers buy, is the lifeblood of what they of what they do. And so, um, skill sets that really manage that and take good care of that are really important. And so that's why we focused on these career areas. And as you can see, it effectively covers business technology as a broad field. These are all really um, concrete starting points in you know, a, specifically a digital marketing entry-level job or project management. But each of these career paths has many, many long tail branches of you can start in project management and then add data as a skill set, or you can start in Salesforce and add analytics as a skill set. So the, another way we think about this is all of these career areas and skills are no regret skills. They are skills that will benefit most anyone in any job area by and large, and that you're able to be paid more, you have, have more doors open to you when you bring these different skill sets together. And so even if you start one place and you pivot and you decide you wanna you know, go down a path that's related to it, building these skill sets together, you functionally just open up more opportunities. I, I, I love that, um, the no regret skill set. Um, and then, you know, connecting it around business technology, that helps me understand it. Um, and and I, I have a lot of conversations just anecdotally with people who are, pursue, who are pursuing career transitions and they always say things like, I wanna find something that's recession proof. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, what you just laid out, Eleanor, like it's getting much closer to having that recession proof skill set. So, so re really recession proof and future proof. So that when increasing automation is a trend that's here to stay, but that it means there's increasingly higher value for the individuals who manage that technology that is overseeing automation. So it's just always staying a little bit ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, now, I think it's one thing to gain proficiency in the, the in-demand digital skills that you just kind of laid out, but it can be a whole other thing as many of us know, to actually get the jobs that are associated with those skills. So with that in mind, I wanted to turn to this question because this is something that we hear from a lot of students and a lot of people who are in career transitions. And they, they ask us things like, well, what's the likelihood that I'm actually gonna get a job in something if I have no quote unquote on the job experience in it, or I didn't study it at a four year degree, even if I've gone and I'll, in an, on an alternative pathway, like I've gotten a past dream certificate or I pursued some other skill-based learning, you know, how can I actually get that job? And so Amy, I'm wondering, you know, given your experience in career services, how would you address that, that question? Yeah, it's the really good chicken and egg question that always comes up. I know, especially for recent graduates when they're like, all these job descriptions say I need at least two years of work experience, but how do I get those two years if I'm just starting out? And similarly, if you're in a career transition moment and you start looking at roles like Salesforce administrator and you see that they're all saying you need two years minimum experience, you might be saying, 
is it even worth it to take a certificate like this? Will it actually help me get a job? And I think in response to that, we've found three key things. So the first is that you should be choosing a program that not only helps you gain the skills in a theoretical way, but actually helps you build a portfolio of on the job projects. And so that's one of the reasons that we've designed past stream courses to let you actually use the software, do real world projects. And then as part of career services, we help you package those into a portfolio that actually demonstrate that you know these tools, these skills and have executed real world business projects. So you can be showing those to employers. The second thing we find really helpful is like I mentioned before, this trend of freelance work or contract work. So you can, even while you have another job or other caregiving responsibilities, start to dabble in some of these career paths by taking on some freelance projects. And then you have more work experience to be adding to your resume to say, I executed you know, a digital marketing strategy for this small startup based in New York um, because you did that through a freelance project. So that's also really helpful. And then the third thing we find is especially because we work with many experienced adults who have been in the workforce for many years, they might just be transitioning to a new field, is that you often have a lot of relevant experience kind of buried in your past work history that we can help you pull out and repackage in a way that's going to make an employer recognize all of the kind of relevant credentials you have for this job. So for example, I work with students a lot who are trying to get a data analyst role. And we can talk through, okay, you were a hotel manager in the past. When did you have to interact with data? How could we pull that out as bullet points on your resume? So that even though an employer might see you've never formally had a data analyst job title, they can map that, oh, you do have relevant and transferable experience. So based on all of that, getting those real world projects you can add to your portfolio, adding freelance or contract opportunities, repackaging your past skill set, and then adding this certificate and maybe even going on to pass an industry exam. With all of that, we are successfully seeing that people can get a job, even if they might have not had the traditional work experience that you might expect when you look at a job description for the first time that an employer might be seeking. Yeah, that's that, that's amazing to see. And, and yeah, I mean, totally to your point, Amy, this, there is this trend of companies that are hiring people from non-traditional backgrounds. Eleanor, I'm wondering if you can put on your, your CEO hat or your executive hat for a second, and you can just talk about what you think is the value in hiring somebody from a non-traditional background to a company. And have we ever done anything like this at Pastream? Have you been a part of a hire like that? And, and what were the results? Uh, we, we absolutely have, and we, we absolutely do. Um, for, from a like leadership perspective or, or building a team and a hiring manager perspective, for one, it's, it's the right thing to do is to look at the labor market and look at your options of talent and candidates and, and be inclusive in the lens of that you're looking at. Um, and, and for us at Pastream, we don't focus on degrees. We actually have many employees who don't have a college degree. Many of our best employees don't have a college degree. Um, What's really important for individuals who are showing up um, interested in a job, you know, from, from our perspective, when we're looking at hiring someone is, does this person, have they really thought about the role that they're applying to? Do they, have they thought about what it's going to take? Have they thought about what success will look like for them? Have they thought about what that employer is needing from this job and this role? And can they speak to their interests, their drive, their passion for what that company does, that industry that they've just gone the extra mile to read the company's website or read if there's a recent news article or press release that's come out or just notice something that it just shows that this isn't just one of, you know, a um, hundred jobs they've applied to, even though you probably should be applying to a hundred jobs, but shows that you took a moment to understand and like pitch that you, that this is, that this job is meaningful to you. And that also so somewhat signals your willingness and ability to learn because you've learned about this company and you've learned about this role. Um, and so when we've hired candidates um, before who didn't have prior work experience in that area or maybe didn't have a degree or, uh, or, or other things like that, what we normally do is we ask someone to complete a test task or a, a sample work project. And what that allows us to do is hear their thought process. And so if an employer gives you an opportunity to do a test task um, and potentially like show off 
that you you know something about this skill set area, that's a great opportunity to highlight. But even if they don't, you can you can be proactive and be ready with that story. That you know, to Amy's point, even if you haven't been in a data analyst job before, even the fact that you know, for a friend's project or a personal project you're working for, that you've thought about solving a problem that mirrors a problem that you might encounter in that role to prove to the employer or the hiring manager that you're taking this really seriously and that you're a thoughtful candidate. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating to hear it from your perspective, being that you are a CEO and an executive, but that's what's going to rise above and grab your attention, is it sounds like that passion, like that specific interest in this job at this company. And that's something that's going to grab you as a CEO. So I think so that's 90% of powerful. candidates aren't going to do that. And so if you do that, you are automatic. And if you do that really well, you'll be that top 1%. Um, so, you know, just by the fact that most people don't do it, it's an easy way to stand out. That's, that is, a, that's a great tip. I hope, I hope people out there are, are taking notice of that. Um, now, speaking of, speaking of, of great tips, it's time for the lightning round, everybody's favorite part of a Q&A. Um, so now that we've discussed some of the economic trends and high demand jobs in, in 2021, let's discuss kind of as, as Eleanor has already kicked us off on some practical tips for actually landing some of these roles in a post pandemic world. Um, so for this lightning round, I wanna focus on the things everyone should know about the job search process in 2021, but many people don't. So I'm gonna throw out some, some common themes like resumes or cover letters or that sort of thing. And, and Amy is going to tell us something that everyone should know about this topic, but maybe a lot of people out there don't quite, uh, don't quite know yet. So Amy, over to you. Our first topic is resumes. What is one thing that everyone should know about resumes, but many people don't? Well, one surprising thing is that formatting of all things really matters. And so we look at hundreds of resumes that past Dream students are sending in, and you would be surprised by how funky some of the formatting can be. And this sounds really basic, but there's research to show that if you have a cleanly formatted resume, you are both more likely to pass what's called an applicant tracking system, which is one of those software filters that many companies are using today to screen candidates. And so the cleaner and clearer your resume formatting is, you have a section that highlights the skills you need, it's in a legible font, all of those things really matter. The second thing is a lot of people are inclined to put a photo on their resume and the research again actually shows that that can lead to a lower interview rate. For some fields where it is a more creative profession, there might be exceptions, but in general, it's better to leave off a photo and leave off some of the sidebars, the graphics, the funky formatting, and really stick to simple templates. And if you're a current student looking for those career services at Pastream has many different templates we can show you, but this would be an example of a resume that's just a little bit too weirdly formatted and you might get screened out on the basis of something as simple as this. So it really matters just to clean it up. And Amy, why, so I think this is something that maybe a lot of people don't know about how a lot of companies use these automated programs to kind of comb through resumes and, and pick out the key skills to even take a second look at the resume. And so maybe a lot of people are sending in resumes and because of the funky formatting, they don't even get past, they don't get through that screening. So can you explain a little bit more like, why is that? What is this automated tool doing and, and how does it interact with the, with the formatting of a resume? Yeah, it's a really good question. So often what it's doing is keyword matching. So an employer will write a job description. They will highlight the key requirements and skills needed for the job. And then basically all this system is doing is matching and seeing if your resume aligns to the skills that are in the job description. And there's usually set a threshold of like 80% of the keywords must be reflected in the resume. And anyone that does not meet that threshold might be just kicked out and never even looked at by a real person. And so one of the key things we often do at Pastream when we work on your resumes with you is just to make sure that you're customizing your resume for every specific job posting. You can have a generic version of your resume, but then you're updating it to make sure that the keywords, the skills, the responsibilities that you're highlighting 
align to the position that you are applying for, just because we don't want you to get passed over for kind of these silly cosmetic reasons. We want you to get to that interview. That's, I think that is a, that's an incredible tip. Um, all right, next topic and lightning round. What is one thing that everybody should know about digital portfolios, but many people don't? So a portfolio can sound really intimidating to get started with, but one thing people don't know is, if you advance to the next slide, there is a lot of free and low cost starter tools that you can use that already have the built-in kind of formatting, all of the design elements, and you can basically be dragging and dropping work samples in there and come up with a clean version um, that is ready to be shared with employers. So you can use basic website tools like Squarespace, Wix, Weebly. None of these require coding. Some of them you can start for free and then pay a low monthly cost to maintain the URL if you want it to have white labeled branding. But you can really simply um, put together a design that highlights your professional experience and shows some of the projects using just a basic website creator. The other tools I'll highlight on here, Pathbrite is an education portfolio company. So again, you can do that for free. We'll show you an example of what their portfolios look like. But if you just Google Pathbrite, Pathbrite you can start checking those out. And then the last one is Cake Resume, which is actually a resume template tool, but it allows you to create a really well-designed digital version of your resume. So if you want a URL to be linking to, that's another form of a portfolio that you can pretty quickly put together. So in the span of a few hours, you can go from having a set of projects to building a really nicely designed portfolio using some of these low cost tools. Yeah, and, and as Amy said, here are some, just some basic examples. And I imagine Amy, like this, for example, like this is, this is just a website, right? That, that someone could click on the top and they could click on biography and resume, portfolio, contact. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So these are all real portfolios that came from students that have completed past stream certificates. And then they just put together these sites to visually display some of their work. And you can click in and see their writing samples, their projects, a little bit about them in a really nicely designed format. This is Pathbrite, that tool I mentioned. So again, Angela went through our digital marketing certificate program. She's added a section for her certificates that she earned and then some of the examples of the content and using this portfolio, she was hired um, for a marketing role at a startup in New York City. And then this is actually Kindle who is on this call today. We just hired her at Pastream and that was because she had such a robust blog developed um, where she highlighted all of these articles she's written. She has a link to her portfolio here. So from an employer perspective, we could really see that Kindle has the writing skills, the marketing skills, and has put in the work over years to document her expertise. Yeah, we, we get lucky. We, uh, our past stream students, we get a first look at them and we can hire them if we, if we want to before anyone else can. So yeah, Kindle's a, Kindle's a really cool story. Um, all right, next topic, Amy, what is one thing everybody should know about cover letters, but many people don't? So I kind of cheated on this one, but I have the ABCs of cover letters. So there's three <laughs> things to know. One is people ask, does it actually matter to write a cover letter in this day and age? And again, the data shows that yes, it does. It does give you an advantage. So you should take the time to write one because they can make you stand out, but they need to be thoughtful and tailored to the job description. The second thing, the B, is to keep them brief. People get intimidated. Oh, I have to write this lengthy essay for every job I want to apply to. You can come up with a pretty standard template that you're just customizing for every role. And you can usually just need around three paragraphs. An employer is not going to want to read like a novel. They're just going to want to read the concise points of who you are, why you're a good fit for the job, and, and what you're excited to bring in terms of skill sets. So the last one is C, just make sure you make it relevant to the company and the job that you're applying for. Know your ABCs, always, always a good tip. Um, all right, moving on. What is one thing that everyone should know about job interviews, but many people don't? So this is basic, but no matter how experienced you are, everyone is almost almost everyone is nervous going into an interview. So if you have some anxiety, if you're on edge, if you're not someone that likes to speak in front of other people and your voice shakes a little, 
don't worry. That's actually a totally normal reaction. And we hear it from more people than not, even if they've had 25 years of work experience, anytime you go in and you're interviewing, it's, it's natural to be a little bit on edge. So the solution to that is to practice. And some people think that, you know, you just have to go into a job interview and just expect the worst and like see what comes at you and respond. But the reality is a lot of interviews are going to have similar questions that are posed or similar themes that, that you are asked about. And so you can prepare in advance, have a neighbor, have a friend, have a colleague, do some mock interviews with you. If you're a past dream student, you can schedule a mock interview with one of our career coaches. And you can start to just have a bucket of stories that you have rehearsed, that you can tell, that highlight your key past skills and experiences, and that are broadly applicable. So even if you're asked you know, one type of question, you can usually plug in and have a story to share because the more real examples um, you can cite, often the better you can perform. So you can practice for these. You don't have to wing it. Yeah. And it looks like, I mean, I'm curious that I didn't know about talk hiring. It's, it looks like this is a company where if you wanted to, you could actually schedule mock interviews with professionals, I'm assuming. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting that. So this is one of the tools that past dream students have access to, and actually you get instant feedback. So it allows you to simulate either a phone interview, a video interview, which are increasingly common these days, all these different types of interviews. And you can record your answer so you can actually hear it played back. And then it even gives you a score on things like how many times did you say, um, were your answers too short? Did you take too many pauses? And so it can start to just give you a sense of how are the trends of where you could improve. And you can just listen back to yourself as painful as that can be, but it can really help. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, last um, one. What is one thing that everyone should know, but many people don't about trial tasks? And maybe we can, yeah, we stay with Amy or Eleanor, either one of you can, can, can tackle this one. I think this one's for Eleanor. <laughs> okay, Eleanor, you wanna, wanna jump in? Well, I think I already gave away my tips on trial tasks, um, but the, I'll just reiterate that I think that one of the, a great opportunity here is don't, th don't think of a trial task as necessarily a really intimidating um, practice. It can, it can be a great opportunity. Usually what the employer is just looking for is to hear your thought process and to hear that you are, you're willing to learn, um, that you're willing to take feedback well, um, in addition to obviously like the content of your answer is great. Like, you know, extra points if you happen to like get it quote unquote right. Um, but, but a lot of times, a lot of what an employer is really looking for is your approach. Did you, were you thoughtful? If you're going to send back a project, make sure there are not typos in it. Make sure it's professional. Do the baseline of showing that you, you put, if you're going to submit it, make sure it's something you're proud of. Um, and then if you have an opportunity, if, if someone actually, if you submit this test task, and sometimes it's just life, like you're not going to get every job that you submit a trial task for. If you get the feedback that, you know, thank you for submitting your trial task. We decided to not move forward with you as a candidate, you know, all the best to you. It's a great opportunity for you to respond and say, you know, thank you for reviewing my trial task. I understand that I'm not moving forward in the process. However, I would love some feedback on my trial task or my interview process. And so they might say no, but you're not going to get for, get what you don't ask for. So you might as well take as an opportunity to, to potentially get some feedback on, on your work or your approach in the process. So, so don't miss out on that feedback that you might get. You put in, don't forget that you put in a lot of work here and, you know, to some extent, some people will say yes um, and, and they will give you really helpful feedback along the way. And they might even build a little bit of a relationship with you by the fact that you show that you want to learn and potentially even point you in the direction of other roles or other jobs um, and, and provide some more professional guidance. Yeah, that is, I mean, incredibly valuable information, um, Eleanor, from both you and Amy. Um, I just want to encourage everyone who's listening right now, if you, you know, some questions have popped into your mind while you've been listening to our discussion, please, by all means, um, feel free to ask those questions in the Q&A. Um, anything at all, really, it's all, it's all fair game. And uh, hopefully, we're not feeling shy, because if, if someone has a question, typically many people have the question. So let's definitely start to get those in there if we can. And um, Lauren, just want to 
check with you. Do we have time for one more question or should we go to the Q&A now? We do. I would definitely go to the net, go to the final question and then just another plug for anybody to put questions in the Q&A, which if I don't answer them, then we will surface them during the formal Q&A in a couple minutes. Okay, great. So let's go to the last written question that we have. Um, just curious now when we start to think about um, the future of work, we hear that term thrown around a lot. So what excites you both the most about the future of work and the job opportunities that are going to continue to grow in 2021 and beyond? Eleanor, um, let's start with you and then we'll go to Amy. I'd say what, what I'm most excited about is that in some ways, by the fact that it, the economy has changed so much and that there are so many more things are digital and online, that, that's an enormous opportunity to increase access. Um, whereas in the past, employers might be able to just screen resumes based on you know, the best brand name colleges because it's there were only so many jobs that they were used to hiring for, those jobs didn't change much over time. Well, that's not true anymore. In order to have the best candidates Companies are starting to publicly announce that they no longer are requiring bachelor's degrees on more and more jobs. They recognize the need to be more inclusive in the way they think about hiring um, and that having a diverse and inclusive workforce is ultimately actually a business objective as well as just the right thing to be doing. Um, and so for all of those reasons, as well as the fact that you know, as you know, we've talked about the rise of more gig jobs and, and, um, and uh, you know, freelance work, that's an, a great opportunity for people to have more freedom in their life and to build their own portfolio, work on things as they choose. And um, it gives them more security to be able to change positions and, and move in and out of different roles because they start to build a brand for themselves and they can share that brand and that brand is more public and available online and over Twitter or Facebook or other social media, um, you can start to, to reach more people with the, the creativity and the quality that you put into your work. Amazing. Amy, same question. I would say that the future of the economy is really going to be led by people who are lifelong learners. And, you know, in the past where you might have been able to earn a university degree and then go and work in the same company for 25 to 30 years until you retire, it's just not the reality anymore. And so, skill sets that are needed are changing really quickly. You know, today it might be that Python and Java are like in-demand programming languages, but it's going to be the people that can self-study, that can use online courses, non-traditional like learning avenues in order to keep learning throughout their career, who are the ones who are gonna stay the most competitive, who are gonna be the most attractive to companies, and it's going to be regardless of where you live in the US or the world, what age you are, what your background is, if you have these kind of skills and this ability to learn quickly and get up to speed, that's I think who is going to be set up for a long-term success. And there's a lot of you know challenges that come with that, but it's also democratizing in many ways because a lot more people are hopefully gonna be able to get these long-term stable jobs. I, I love that coming from a background in education, of course, the, the importance of being a lifelong learner. And Eleanor, from comments that you made, also from the executive perspective, the ability to demonstrate your willingness to learn and how you learn being a real asset um, in a post-pandemic economy. So that's amazing answers, um, amazing insights and information. Uh, we're going to very shortly turn it over to the audience for some Q&A. Um, so take a moment, you all, and, and make sure that anything you're curious about, anything at all, you, you put it in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, if you're interested in learning any of these PathStream programs, we have some information here. You can go to pathstream.com slash programs and learn about what we offer. Um, and uh, just to highlight a new program that we have that we're very excited about, it's the Foundations of Data Science with Python, and it's a certificate that's offered by NYU and Emory. So that's something if folks out there are interested in, please check it out. But we want to hear your questions. We want to hear what you might be curious about. So Lauren, I'll turn it over to you and, and anything that you're seeing or any themes or questions that have come up, feel free to pose them to Eleanor or Amy. Thank you guys. Um, so I've definitely been answering a lot of questions. And if, if any of those answers are not satisfactory, you send them right back. 
and we will get more information on them. But a lot of the questions that have come in so far um, have been uh, really about kind of job, job really, really job specific questions. Um, so I want to give everybody like a couple seconds to just populate any final questions that they might have, um, given that, you know, there's been a lot of information shared. So I just kind of want to give people a couple of seconds to think of questions that may be coming up if they have any. Felipe asked a question um, about, you know, interacting with people and how learning really with other people is really important. And, and, and if there are any sort of group projects or formal study groups um, through Pastream. And right now, kind of, we, we really set up our programs um, to be really much for working adults that might be on all sorts of different schedules. So we don't have any kind of live synchronous formal study groups. But um, Felipe, I would imagine that you have access to Piazza if you're in the Salesforce program, which is one of the ways that we really recommend that you interact with students and, and, and just kind of ask questions on there if, you, if you're struggling. So we've really set up this online environment called Piazza um, where you can kind of message back and forth with other people um, in the program. Other, other questions that are coming up. Um, there was a question in the chat around from Dana around um, any languages that are in high demand. And I wish that I knew the answer to that, um, but I don't know uh, if there are any specific languages that are in really high demand right now. General question is how important is it to be bilingual? And I would say that is definitely an added competency that can make you more competitive in this increasingly global economy. Um, we, especially in the U.S., see that Spanish, you know, is on the rise as we have more of a Spanish-speaking population. I do get postings from staffing agencies that are specifically looking for people that have that competency. But any of the major, you know, global languages, if you know how to speak them, I think can definitely set you up to be an asset, especially in some of these multinational corporations that are doing business with all parts of the world. So it's not a traditional digital skill or technical skill, but it is definitely something that can make you more competitive. As one of the questions that just came in or is as most of the jobs are becoming tech-based, is it recommended to learn coding? And if yes, where should I start? Um, Amy, I'm curious, you know, how many of the kind of jobs that you're seeing or, or by talking to hiring managers are really requiring the coding skill versus kind of other technical skills? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, there's definitely lots of free resources out there from, you know, Free Code Academy to Code.org that can help you gain fluency in some of these basic programming languages. And we definitely see that if you have those technical skills any, of any type that can make you stand out. That said, pastream programs are really specifically designed to help you enter a tech career without needing more of these formal coding languages. And so if you know something like Salesforce, or if you know something like um, the basics of data analytics using SQL, you can still get really competitive jobs with good salaries, even if you don't know those coding languages. So it's a nice to have, and it's good to kind of know the basic concepts that are associated with programming. So when you're interacting with engineers or people that are using those languages, you can kind of converse with them, but it's not necessarily um, a prerequisite for the career path that Pastream focuses on. The one thing I might add there is um, what's maybe not surprising, but we do hear in the news a lot about like the shortage of software engineers and there's lots of coding boot camps that have come up. But when you look at the labor market, it kind of makes sense that there's actually like five to 10 times more jobs that require being able to use technology, a software platform like Salesforce or like Asana or like a digital marketing ad platform or Tableau for data visualization that requires no coding at all. It's just using a software interface. Um, there's, there's maybe 10 times more of those jobs because that's across all of marketing and all of customer success and all of sales and all of product and project management. Um, every single one of those fields uses these technologies and software engineering is a much more specific, um, it's a high paid career path. Um, and so to some extent, if you want to definitely do software engineering, then yeah, great, you absolutely should. It's a wonderful career path. There's great, great paying jobs. You have a lot of job security. But for those who that might be, 
you know, for one, it's going to take a while if you're starting from no technical skill set to really being ready for a software engineering job. Um, or if it feels like a big, too big of a first step, then I'd say a, a recommendation would be to start with a no code so technical skill, a no regret skill set like Salesforce or project management, where if you start there, you can become more fluent and familiar with digital skills that gives you a great foundation and entry lay that you can then jump into taking that more technical path into software engineering as a next step if you're not ready to make that you know, commitment or decision up front. Another question, um, Eleanor, that's come up is you mentioned earlier on that you wanted, you really had advice or you saw something in the top 1% of candidates that make them stand out from the rest. And I just think that because that is getting some questions, can you just kind of repeat that advice and really just put a, put a point on it? Oh, you're muted though. So what I was um, saying about the candidates that shine as those top 1% candidates that we see are candidates that show a genuine interest in the company, a genuine interest in the role, and that it, you know, you, you as anything, like when, when, and when we're looking for candidates, there's so many people who just put in a, a resume as they, the same resume they put in many places. And, you know, for us as an employer, we're actually looking for someone to be joining our team. They're going to be working with us and working with our students and making our programs better and our product better. We want to bring someone onto our team that wants to be a part of this team, not the team next door. And so when any way that, that individual can show that they've looked into this company and they know something about it or they care about the mission um, or they have a, a perspective about how they're going to contribute to, to that company when they start, if you can articulate why you want this job, what you're going to do when you get this job, um, then that, that makes you stand out so much more in the process. And so, you know, being thoughtful in that interview process as well as just really reading that job description and thinking about what am I going to do in the job in this company? And if you don't know much about this job area, you can ask other people and get some more ideas, but coming into that interview with like, you know, this is even saying like, this is my understanding of the role. This is what I think I would be doing. This is what I think I could really contribute I have some questions because I really want to make sure that I understand what you as the employer are asking of me to do because I want to do a great job. Thank you. Um, there's another question coming up uh, around kind of the different types of competition and, and placement challenges between citizens versus permanent residents, i.e. those with green cards. Amy, is that something that you can, you can comment on? I mean, unfortunately, the reality is that it always is harder to find a job if you don't have U.S. work authorization, and that is often because you need an employer to be sponsoring you. So it's definitely not impossible, and if you have technical skills, that can really help in, you know, making the case for why they should hire you. Um, but that said, you, this is also a good opportunity if you are in a situation where your visa might be pending to explore things like freelance work or taking online courses where you can be gaining experience through different kinds of projects and adding to that resume as you work towards U.S. work authorization. So unfortunately, yes, it is competitive, but it can definitely happen um, and, and you can do things to make progress on it in the meantime. Amy, I wanted to, I saw a question come on a little earlier and um, just wanted to get your your two cents on it too, but about how students who maybe need to prioritize the search for remote work. So how, you know, how can, you know, as somebody who's who needs to work remotely, like what are the ways that they can really find like a remote position? Are there any tips or tricks in that regard? And a freelance position, Amy, I would also add re remote and freelance too is, is, a, is a question that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good questions. I mean, first, I would say that during COVID, a lot of the major job boards, so including LinkedIn, Indeed, all of the ZipRecruiter, they added specific filters to their site. So you can search now specifically for jobs that are posted for remote opportunities. So that's one way. It's just the filtering is a lot better. You can search for those specifically. There are also job boards that are dedicated specifically to posting remote work jobs. So if you search on Google remote work, you can come up with a few different ones um, that, will, that will have these kind of opportunities. But the third thing I would say is that 
you know, a lot of companies now are open to negotiating this, especially if you're looking at companies in the tech sector. So even if it's not formally stated, you can ask about it during the interview process or once you get an offer. So I would not rule out places right now just because they don't specifically say it in the job description. Um, and then I saw, you know, some people are also belonging to specific populations like military spouses where they're going to be transferring a lot. And again, I would look for those specific job boards or organizations that are set up to serve those kind of populations because often they are able to curate a set of employers that are open to these kind of work arrangements. And then in terms of freelance opportunities, we mentioned some of the big ones, which are Upwork and Fiverr. We use a virtual internship platform called Parker Dewey to help people find paid project work. But for all of the different career verticals, especially things like digital marketing, there are also more specific job boards that you can be finding. So if, again, if you are a past stream student, we actually have a checklist of all of these different job boards that we've put together that can help you find these kind of project-based roles. So we're happy to share that, but those are a few of the tips I would, I would use. And maybe just, just one more question I just saw just came in. It's, it's this idea of um, getting, you know, professional certification. So like maybe a, a CAPM certification or a Salesforce administrator certificate, like officially from Salesforce, like how valuable are, are things like that um, when it comes to the job search in, in your experience? Yeah, and I saw some of those questions too, which I think are just generally, if you earn a professional certificate and then even go on to earn the certification exam, can those help with internal promotion or transfer? And I would say definitely yes. Like these things will help you stand out to your employer. Many employers will actually pay for you to take these courses. They might have a professional development stipend that you can use. And it is much more cost effective for them to train internal employees who have these in-demand skill sets who can then take on new positions than to have to hire from scratch. So if you see a role in your company you know, that you are curious about, definitely ask if you can use your professional development allowance to take a course, to earn a certification, to pass one of those industry exams to really demonstrate that you have the skills needed. It's often really much easier to get your first job in that new career field at your existing company than trying to apply cold to somewhere else. So definitely take advantage of that. And, and we've definitely seen people who, you know, know that their company is going to be moving to a system like Salesforce or starting to be using Asana or going to roll out Tableau. And so they want to get ahead of the curve and be the expert or the trainer within their company. So taking a certificate can really be a way to get a leg up, you know, and set you up for internal promotion or transfer. That is a great answer and a great segue because we're going to be wrapping up this um, first and foremost, the, the session tonight. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for joining. Those were excellent questions. The participation was amazing. Eleanor and Amy, two of the most brilliant people I know. It is always a pleasure to get to talk to you and pick your brain. I always learn something listening to you all speak. So thank you. And uh, just wanted to also let everybody know that we're going to have many more of these workshops. So you'll see that next week, we're going to have another panel conversation. And this is with some of our past stream student alumni. Um, we're gonna do a panel with them and a Q and A. And some of them, um, for example, have done exactly what Amy said, which is flexed in their current roles to become the Salesforce expert or the data expert in their company. So that's what gave me the idea for the segue. And then after that, Lauren, um, who had an amazing workshop last week is going to do a few more of these workshops on using design thinking to design your career, how to tell your story during the job interview process and beyond. And then finally on June 24th, we're gonna wrap everything up with uh, hopefully a funnier event where we share some lighthearted job search stories. And that's gonna be a live podcast for those out there who listen to the Pastoring Podcast. It'll be a live version of that. Um, like we said at the beginning, we're going to put this recording up on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to the Pastoring YouTube channel to watch the recording. Um, but yeah, just thank you once again for everyone who joined. And Eleanor and Amy, like I said, you're, you're amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining and taking time out of your busy lives to, to share your evening with us. I just want to reiterate as we close out that this really is an exciting time of 
the economy is coming back and growing. So many industries are opening back up. There's so many new opportunities based on like what technology is bringing to the workforce. And you don't have to be amazing at math and you don't have to know coding. You don't have to work in tech. There, these jobs are emerging in every industry in every city. And it's a wonderful opportunity for, for individuals to expand their skill sets and to access new opportunity. And to do that, I think some of the things we touched on tonight is just thinking about customizing your approach when you're talking to employers and making sure that you let your story shine and that fit shine, and then show off that you're a lifelong learner. Clearly everyone that showed up here tonight has some bones of lifelong learning in them, um, taking, taking this step and making carving out time for this. And so showing off that you're, you're learning in demand skills, that you're willing to learn on the job and continuing to just to, to sh let this, this type of, um, Dem demonstrate this within yourself in those interviews as well. And you'll do great because that's exactly what employers are looking for. Everyone's going to have to, you know, as Amy said, the best, the best talent is the talent that's always learning. And if you can show off what you've shown off tonight, um, you'll have lots of opportunities in front of you. So thank you for being with us.